Yes, Professor, we are live. Manakam. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, bonum mamane to all of us joined today from the different time zones of the world. One cannonball and 500 years later, here we are, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the quincentenary, the 500th year of conversion of St. Ignatius of Loyola, we welcome you all to this online lecture on discerning leadership. Act as if everything depended on you. Trust as if everything depended on God, St. Ignatius of Loyola. I would like to call upon the Loyola ECAM College of Engineering and Technology, Mr. Team, organized by Professor Suman to invoke God's blessings before we proceed. Kindly take over, Mr. Team. <coughs> When you think of discerning leadership, a picturesque portrait of a man carrying a cross never would evade our memory. Though the weight of the cross was bars of lead on his weary shoulders, the weight of his desire to save humanity was even heavier on his heart. His selfless choices made him a discerning leader. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, a man known for his leadership is known for discernment of spirits. Thereby, he could yield to the will of God. The humanness of these great men are stressed upon to assert that each and every person like us is driven by a desire to lead, to inspire, and to contribute to the greater good of society. It could be in our day-to-day -day roles as parents, teachers and students. Within each of us is a leader who strives to push boundaries and set examples. Would we give our nod to be a discerning leader? Let us invoke the presence of God amidst us with this prayer song. Yeah. 
thank you for the wonderful praise of Mr. Poon. As an executive director of the program for discerning leadership, our resource person mentions that discerning leadership is based on treasure of Ignatian spirituality. Also, discerning leadership is more of a transformed leadership <coughs> characterized by listening than speaking and approaches decision making as a creative and collaborative exercise for the service of the world and especially in including the excluded, that is, those who are the most marginalized. We are all ears to actively listen to you, Father. Now I call upon our man of wisdom, Reverend Father Rector Francis Xavier S.J., Vice President of the Loyola Institutions, to welcome the listeners. Over to you, Father. Dear friends, welcome to this program. The prerequisite for a leader is the capability to take decision. Not simply safe or smart decision, but the right solution. And this needs a careful examination process at the intellectual sphere and at the emotional level. This is discerning. And we are here to become informed of discerning leadership. Appearing to Solomon, God asked him what he wanted. And Solomon said, I am the king and I need to lead my people. Hence, give me understanding mind and discerning heart. Wise man as he was, he wanted an analytical brain combined with a loving heart in order to lead his people on firm and safe path. He wanted the mind to decipher right from wrong and the heart to be free from any attachment and prejudice. He knew that the synchronization of heart and head will guide the hand to do the right thing at the right time. And the discerning leader is expected to think with his heart, touch with his eyes, and walk with his hands. The Jesuit formation is integration of head, heart, and hand. After long years of intellectual formation, the Jesuit has the final training in the school of love called tertianship. There he is trained to embrace all in his mission field and to grow in the maturity as Pope Francis would expect the leader to be with the smell of his sheep. He or she should feel for the people and eventually should become one with the people he or she serves. Like the mother who anticipates the needs of her baby, a leader should know, understand, and do what is needed most for the people. And the running thread is discernment, which is constant combing of his feeling with the intellectual search for the better. The compass is the compassion, and the dynamics is the readiness to march with the marginalized. This discernment, as Pope Francis admonished to the members of the 36th General Congregation, is not just a tool for decision-making process, but it should be the way of life. We see St. Ignatius also choosing between two good options namely between serving the earthly king and the heavenly king. His choice made the difference, not only for himself, for the entire world. He left his soldier gear, but put on armor of education that would enlighten minds and enliven hearts, giving direction to do the best for the least. Though he started with preaching, soon who moved over to teaching since he was convinced that education was the key to empowerment. The spiritual exercises is built on the basis of discernment. 
not only choosing the right from the wrong tendencies, but keep going steady with the right insights all along. And today, the followers of St. Ignatius have chosen the path of discernment. The outcome is to network with the partners in mission, the faculty members in educational institutions, socially committed people in social action centers, religiously enthusiastic people in pastoral areas, budding leaders among the youth, etc. If Magis is the trademark, discernment is the benchmark of the Jesuits and Jesuit collaborators. Let us remember that anyone who is chasing two rabbits at the same time may end up catching none. A leader should possess singularity of mind, but at the same time, he or she should be capable of multitasking, becoming all for all. A leader should be conscious of the other, and he or she should be able to see and understand the world of the other from the other's perspectives. The mastery comes by discernment practice. Today, we have Father David McCallum, who is the Executive Director on Discerning Leadership at the Jesuit headquarters in Rome. I met him during the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities meeting in July 2018 in Bilbao, Spain. Let me welcome Father David to share his insights with us all and welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Xavier. Thank you also to Professor Esther and, and to Professor Suman and her students for the beautiful uh, song that we heard as we began. Um, it is truly a privilege for me to address you. David, and, David, David. Yes. I'm going to introduce you. Oh. Uh, we, we don't allow you like that, DCD, huh? wait. I thought Francis Xavier just introduced me. But he, he gave an gave a in, inaugural note. Okay. You, are, you are speaking to Indians, you remember that. Now you're going to say all the embarrassing things. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, sir, yes, sir. I, will, I will start the working. Thank, Thank you, Father. You. I would like to call upon uh, our man of action, Reverend Father Jorun S.J., to introduce the resource person for the day. Over to you, Father. David, please uh, be patient. Uh, I will I will not embarrass you, but at least for the sake of uh, most of our Jesuits know, but uh, most of our faculty and others would like to know who is speaking. You know, uh, They should not concoct stories, at least some facts I would like to share with all. Uh, Father Rector and others and friends, uh, faculty and all other well-wishers, you know, this is the book written by John O. Marley, the first Jesuits. He concludes the last page, this. According to Polanco, the secretary of St. Ignatius of Loyola, Ignatius of Loyola possessed in an uncommon degree certain natural gifts from God, Great energy in undertaking extraordinarily difficult tasks. Great constancy in perceiving them. And great prudence in seeing them to completion. What he said of Ignatius could be applied as well to himself and not all one of the companions, which makes it another important key to the character and the development of the early Society of Jesus. If I remember my interactions with Father David McCallum, what is applied to Nadal? I would say applies to also David McCallum. David McCallum is a Jesuit priest and leadership consultant and educator. He serves as the founding executive director of the program for discerning leadership, a very, very important special project of International Association of Jesuit Universities, the general office, what we call general courier of the Society of Jesus and the Gregorian University. The program provides leadership formation for senior Vatican officials 
and major superiors of religious orders in Rome and Italy. Prior to this current position, Father McCallum served as the Vice President for Mission Integration and Development in the USA and Father McCallum serves as the facilitator for mission-driven personal and organization development programs, provides developmentally informed executive coaching and delivers leadership development programs and spiritual retreats internationally. His education, bachelor degree in English, integral honors from Lehman College, master's degree in philosophy, Fordham University, and licentiate uh, Masters in Divinity and Theology, Western School of Theology, now it's a Boston College School of Theology and Ministry, and doctoral degree in Adult Learning and Leadership from Columbia University, and his research interests in Adult Learning, Leadership Development, Group Dynamics. I have worked with him more than three years. I can boldly say I was part of also the inter international, even part of this International Task Force for Ignatian Leadership, we fire off us, mission integration. I can see that he has been a passionate leader. And he could listen to people and understand people, what Ignatius would call a discerning leader who can always be in touch with what is going on in the heart, not in the mind alone. He's not a cerebral, but a rather a leader who can understand the inner movements and motivation its intentions i have learned a lot is an edifying personality i think his sharing with us today it's not going to be cerebral it is going to change our hearts in the tertian shape the last part of our formation we say it's a school of the heart we come out heart changed i hope at the end of the talk we'll all come out heart changed Welcome, David. My goodness, Joe, that is very embarrassing. And I'm very grateful for your introduction. I appreciated how Professor Esther described you as the man of action and Father Francis Xavier as the man of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> you are truly a man of action. And I'm grateful oh, for yes, your- Yes, David, yes, David, our way of proceeding today. I'm Maria Rudraja. I'm Maria Rudraja. You know, discernment is something to do with the very breath. I breath, therefore I am. This is a philosophy of life. So when Black George Lloyd was crushed down by the white cop, the one of the stunning statement was, I can't breathe. COVID-19 is something to do with a good breath and bad breath. So enlivening breath and the toxic breath. Today, we are talking about the good spirit and evil spirit. And you know, my dear friends, discerning is a way of breathing, in, perceiving, smelling, tasting, deciding, choosing, performing, collaborating. So I request all of you to listen to David. David, who is an expert at you know killing the Goliath of evil spirit, Goliath of evil spirit, and I request all of you to just come out with your brief bullets of queries, opinions, experiences. The remaining 70 minutes would be budgeted like this, 40 minutes by McCallum and the rest of the 30 minutes by us with the conversation. These questions would be processed by Father Jacob, Father Irde Raj, Father Justin. Over to you, McCallum. We are eager to listen to you. Okay. I'm so sorry for all my interruptions <laughs> in this process. Um, well, where to begin? First of all, uh, again, my thanks. It's a privilege to be with you. Um, why is this particular subject so important at this particular moment? Um, I think we know, especially as we've experienced the the pain as well as the possibility that this COVID pandemic has created, that we live in times that are not easy, that that are very deeply disturbed in so many ways. And if we think about the way that um, when, uh, when water in a pond is disturbed, it becomes cloudy, uh, it becomes very clear 
um, how unclear it is to make choices, how difficult it is to discern our ways forward. And, um, and if we think about the consequence of the decisions we make these days as leaders and the impact we make upon others, unless we have the ability to allow the water to clear and, and to see our paths forward, um, then we know that we don't lead for the good. And, um, and as uh, those inspired by Christ, those inspired by the spirituality of St. Ignatius, we know that our, our leadership for the good is what is really what animates us. So without further ado, I want to share my presentation with you and invite you to uh, take some notes if that is helpful to you as we go. I'm going to uh, play the presentation and hopefully this will all appear on your screens. Just give me a nod if that looks like it's working. Okay. Okay, very good. Okay, so we already have had uh, from Father Arul a sense of um, where we're going over the course of these next 70 minutes or so. Um, and I'm going to ask you to situate yourself to to pause for a moment and to consider wherever you are in your own position within the university, within the colleges, as a faculty member, um, leading students, forming students, doing research, providing service in the institution. Um, where are you called to lead? Um, for staff, for administrative members, people responsible for serving the students and for the, for the community. Um, how does leadership show up in your life? And how is this relevant to you, this conversation? And then also for my Jesuit brothers, at this particular moment in history, our, our roles, the things that we're called to do, pull us in many directions. Um, but in, in fact, most of us, I think, would, would express that Leadership is part of our, our call. It's what we're being asked to do by the Society of Jesus, by the church, um, by the institutions in which we operate and live. Whether we were originally uh, thinking of ourselves as leaders or not. And so, as is the case with many of the prophets in the Old Testament, how have we been called either willingly or unwillingly into these roles of service and responsibility, formal or informal? Before we, um, we enter too deeply into the presentation, I want to begin with a, a story. Um, when we think about leadership so often, I think we become preoccupied with what we can see and touch and feel and act upon. Um, as we were reminded, Father Joe Arun is a man of action. He makes things happen, as I'm sure all of you do. And this can preoccupy us with what we can see and feel and touch. That's the objective world around us, our institutional resources and how we manage them, our enrollment and how we build it, um, our revenue so that we can continue to sustain our institutions. These are all tangible. And yet we know that so much of what leadership is about, as we heard from Father Francis, is the intangible is the invisible, it is um, matters of thought and matters of feeling, it's the subjective. So I invite you to pay attention to this story that comes from ancient China about Prince Tai and for it to open up for you in whatever way it might, some understanding. In the third century, King Tso sent his son Prince Tai to the temple to study under a great master, Han Ku. And because Prince Tai was to succeed his father as king, Han Ku was to teach the boy the basics of being a good ruler. When the prince arrived at the temple, the master sent him alone into the Ming Li forest. And his assignment after one year was to return to the temple to describe the sound of the forest. When Prince Tai returned after the year, 
Panku asked the boy to describe all that he could hear. Master, replied the prince, I could hear the cuckoos sing, the leaves rustled, the hummingbirds hum, the crickets chirp, the grass blow, the bees buzz, and the wind whisper and howl. When the prince had finished, the master told him to go back to the forest to listen to what more he could hear. The prince was puzzled by the master's request. Had he not discerned every sound already? For days and nights on end, the young prince sat alone in the forest listening, but he heard no sounds other than those he had already heard. Then one morning, as the prince sat silently beneath the trees, he started to discern faint sounds unlike any he had heard before. The more acutely he listened, the clearer the sounds became. A feeling of enlightenment came over the boy. These must be the sounds the master wished me to discern, he reflected. When Prince Tai returned to the temple, the master asked him what more he had heard. Master responded the prince reverently. When I listened more closely, I could hear the unheard. The sound of flowers opening. The sound of the sun warming the earth. The sound of the grass drinking the morning dew. The master nodded approvingly. To hear the unheard, marked Pantu, is a necessary discipline for the good leader. For only when a leader has learned to listen closely to people's hearts, hearing their feelings uncommunicated, pains unexpressed, complaints not spoken of, can he hope to inspire confidence in his people, understand when something is wrong, and meet the true needs of his citizens. The demise of states and civilizations come when leaders listen only to superficial words and do not penetrate deeply into the souls of the people to hear their true opinions and feelings and desires. Learning to pay attention to the unseen. When we discuss what discerning leadership is, this is very much about paying attention to what is both seen and unseen, to what is perceivable and to what is what is deeply uh, challenging for us to perceive if we're rushing through life, if we're inundated with tasks, if we're unable to take a pause and to reflect. So I want to share with you a framework that we use in the discerning leadership program to help us pay attention to the total territory of leadership in organizations, both the seen and the unseen. We call this the integral approach to leadership, and it's a conceptual map which guides us in many ways as conceptual maps uh, also guide our research, our teaching, and the work we do as administrators. It is inspired by the work of a philosopher by the name of Kim Wilbur. And this framework begins, first of all, in four quadrants. The first is the subjective. It's the interior of myself as an individual. What do I experience as, uh, as a person interior to myself in terms of values and attitudes? When Father Arun was reflecting on the experience of COVID and how it has brought forth much creativity, the attitude he expresses of seeing what is positive and appreciating what's possible is a distinct one, and not everyone has that same attitude. What intentions do we carry for what we want to do in, in our day? Um, how do we want to bring ourselves into relationship with others? What assumptions do we operate on? This is the interior experience of the individual. Next, we have the external, what is observable about the individual, our actions, our behaviors, our training, what others can see from the outside in. 
these are the skills and abilities that we demonstrate by the way that we do what we do each day. And they can be measured, they can be rated by performance. These skills, these abilities are more tangible. In the lower left quadrant, very important for us as leaders and organizations, we attend to what is interior to us as a community. And that is, for instance, culture. What is the culture of the institution in which I'm living and working? What are the shared values and purposes that unite us with all of our differences that help us to lead in a way that is in the direction of a common goal? What is the quality of relationships that exist amongst us? As you could tell early in the call, um, there's a spirit of friendship amongst us as Jesuits and, and that friendship translates into a spirit of trust and the ability to work together collaboratively. How is that extension of trust and of friendship, that sense of collegiality experienced across the institution so that we can make decisions that are deeper and, and that actually harmonize diverse interests without becoming political and charged with controversy? How do we develop a culture which is animated by values and purposes that are mission inspired? And then finally, there is this question of the most tangible aspects of us as, as institutions, as communities, the structures, the policies, the resources that we operate with, the use of our symbols, the rituals that we, we perform, and the outputs of us as, as an organization. So what are the quality of our students' contributions in society? How does our research make an impact in terms of the social challenges that we face? How do we achieve a level of excellence, which is measurable? How do we steward our resources in ways that are sustainable? So these four quadrants are territories for leaders to pay attention, and they include both what is visible and invisible, the seen, the unseen, the heard, and the unheard. As we explore this question of discerning leadership, we think it's important to define our terms. And so, first of all, we ask, what is leadership in an Ignatian context? And here are some, some actions that leaders, I think, it perform in an Ignatian context, which is different, which are distinct from another schools and organizations. And we begin by saying that leadership is the exercise of influence. As was described earlier in this conversation, it's not simply formal roles of authority, those who have titles. Every one of us is able to exercise leadership. And we do so anytime we take initiative for a good greater than ourselves that is on behalf of others and the institution. The first of these eight um, principles of what leaders do in an Ignatian context is they mobilize people for the mission. We as Jesuits are entrusted with a Catholic Jesuit mission, and yet we want to create this mission with diverse partners. And so the first work of serving the mission is matched with the second, which is creating a culture, a community, which welcomes and embraces diversity and which affirms our distinct vocations and callings which also promotes underrepresented groups, including women. In many parts of our world, where women are not equally represented, both in terms of our student bodies or our administrations and leadership positions, we as Jesuits are dedicated to working to create more opportunity. So that this embrace of diversity is in fact a representation of our Jesuit and Catholic mission. We nurture the learning and development of people. This is core for us as Jesuits and as Jesuit colleagues to take account of the current personalis of the people entrusted into our care, but not only to care for them, to also challenge them to continue to grow and develop. A key task for us as we seek to magnify the impact of our work is to facilitate collaboration, to create strategic networks, to deepen the quality of 
the groups and the teams that we operate with so that the impact, the, the results that we create are greater. It's not enough to be a mission institution, a mission driven institution, if we're not generating some impact. And finally, um, as we think about impact, we want to expand the number of people served, especially those who are poor and marginalized. You know this as, as your mission, especially there in the Tamil Nadu province, the, the Loyola Chennai province. We seek to guide the sustainable stewardship and management of resources in the spirit of Laudato Si. And finally, as, as Joe Arun and Father Francis were communicating, conveying a positive, hope filled future, not one that's doom and gloom, but one inspired by a shared vision of common good. So these are aspects, I think, that are very, very distinctive leadership qualities in an Ignatian context. Another set of definitions, what do we mean by Ignatian discernment? Not only at the individual level, but also the, the collective. At the individual level, we've heard described the importance of this interior freedom freedom from all the things that undermine our capacity to love and to make choices aligned with God's will. This individual discernment is then magnified when we enter into community together to discern how to operate as both communities and institutions. And so it's also a process used by groups and teams and communities to grow in that collective interior freedom to listen together to the unfolding will of God and to choose better how to serve a greater good. So it's not only good judgment, but also good judgment inspired by a, a higher purpose. When we think about what leadership and discernment have to do with one another, I take as a definition this statement from our inauguration of the institute the uh, association, the International Association of Jesuit Universities in Bilbao in 2018, leadership in an Ignatian way of proceeding. It must be a way of proceeding that encompasses all the skill dimensions that we would think of for any excellent leader, as well as additional elements that are rooted in a spiritually mature inner life and the capacity to discern both alone and together. It's this capacity for inner freedom, discernment within oneself and others that is centered in values and purposes oriented toward that greater good and the ability to make choices for the benefit of a wider and wider group of stakeholders, not only our students, our learning community, but also the stakeholders in our wider communities in which our institutions are situated. When we consider the overlap of these various areas, the work of leadership, the work of discernment, it's always contextualized. So the context in which we're operating here in Rome is very distinct, obviously from the one there in Loyola and Chennai. And yet um, it's at the intersection of our work of leadership, our discernment of this unfolding will of God and the context, the demands, the particular qualities of the culture, the, uh, the concerns, uh, the opportunities that exist there at that local level, which are so important. When we consider the context in which we're situated today, there are certain universal conditions that we face all around the world. And um, they're relevant to us because of the way that they intrude upon us in many ways and can cause us to react and respond in ways that may or may not be discerning. When we consider the conditions, for instance, of this past year and a half and the challenges that were really stirred up by the COVID pandemic, there are four characteristics that um, researchers have described as, as very much uh, aspects of our culture overall in the world today and ones that we must manage and confront as leaders. If we can pause for a moment to take in this slide, the acronym VUCA describes these four contextual qualities in which we find ourselves as discerning leaders today. This acronym was first used to describe the way in which um, military members were trying to, to work 
uh, against terrorism and how terrorists were working so quickly to adapt themselves to the circumstances that um, the army was not able to actually work effectively to, to counteract this terrorism. And these four characteristics um, became actually very popular in leadership literature because it's not only in those extreme situations, but also in our day to day lives that these four characteristics seem to have such impact and influence on us. The first is volatility. V for volatility refers to the speed at which disruption is taking place these days. The way in which the pandemic came upon us within a very short period of time, even though anticipated by scientists, very quickly reached a, a level of impact that was unforeseen. And this volatility increases the complexity in which we're trying to operate as leaders. Because um, as we know, systems are interconnected. Our educational networks are interconnected with the, the wor world in which they're operating, the economies, the politics, the, the geopolitical dynamics, the religious dynamics of our times. This complexity makes it difficult to sometimes sort out as leaders, where do we intervene in a situation? Where do we, where do we stop to pause and, um, and to, to do the diagnosis, to understand the underlying causes of the challenges that we're facing, the problems we face? Uncertainty, um, as you know, uh, uncertainty is something that we live with every day. If we're honest about it, we have no idea what tomorrow will bring. Jesus spoke about this in the Gospels. That's why we should be preoccupied instead with what we're doing now in this moment. However, um, uncertainty has become certainly more and more clear, uh, a factor that leaders have to understand and anticipate as we try to plan for the future. It used to be that we would look uh, sometimes five to 10 years down the road to create a strategic plan. And now we realize that kind of planning is now impossible. We have to factor in the reality of uncertainty. And again, as discerning leaders, we have to face the fact that uncertainty can create certain experiences emotionally for us of anxiety. Finally, ambiguity. We live in times where many of the institutions that have given us uh, reference points of meaning and value are no longer as trustworthy or as prominent as they once were. We've often lost a sense of our traditional moorings of values and the stories that have um, been important to us as people. And now there's a lot less clarity about the world in terms of what it means and how we're to meant to operate in it. Um, sometimes in a very pluralistic context, uh, there's a competition amongst um, those who want to make sense and meaning. And one of the key tasks of leaders is in fact to shape and to frame what is meaningful and important, what should, what should have priority. The impact of VUCA is that it can instigate anxiety and fear. And when we think about this from a discernment point of view, Ignatius was very cautious about uh, the experience of fear or desolation because he realized it could constrain our decision-making and hamper our creativity and undermine our ability to discern and follow God's will. Luca's temptations, right, for us as leaders is to develop an inward focus, one that is not mission oriented, but is about self maintenance and survival. It can preoccupy us with a sense of gathering more resources for ourselves rather than what we can contribute. It can overwhelm us with a sense of immediate reaction as a way of uh, offsetting the fear and relieving anxiety or of paralysis of not being able to act at all because we feel overwhelmed. There can be a regression to wanting to do what we've always done because it feels familiar and safe. And as leaders, this is a very powerful pull for us. How do we open ourselves to the future with a mindset of creativity and openness when fear is, is instigating us to go back to what's most familiar? what we've known and done before. And we know in educational contexts, there is for a long time been a sort of atmosphere 
where the past has been a good predictor for the future, um, but no longer, no longer. Now we know that operating out of our comfort zones, trying to repeat what we've always done is actually a slow death for us as educators. We know one of the in, um, challenges of, um, of VUCA is a rigidity or sense of control um, around our decision making to try to consolidate power. Another is to try to simply be obedient to what um, others say instead of taking risks for ourselves. It's to exercise unilateral power, to, to come in as the one who is going to fix things and to promise solutions, um, but often at a cost of all the creativity that could take place if others were invited in. Often there's a paring down of the, the diagnosis of the challenges and, and problems and a closing off from others. So if these are the temptations that these VUCA conditions create as discerning leaders in an Ignatian tradition, we're invited to take a step back, not to go it alone, to pause with others, to reflect on the situations that we face, to avoid making choices under the influence of fear or in a time of desolation, and to really examine the spirit in which we're making our choices and trying to lead. There's two distinct dispositions that uh, are well known in the literature of leadership and organizations. One, which I'm about to show you, is a cycle that's instigated by the reactivity that fear causes. And the other is a proactive cycle of co-creation and planning, which is more generative and more positive and comes from a place of our values and our sense of contribution. When we look on the left-hand side, the natural temptation when a challenge such as the pandemic comes over us is to try to solve the problem. It is to focus on the threat and out of fear to react in a way that will solve the problem as quickly as possible. This is a natural cycle and loop, and sometimes it's entirely appropriate. For instance, when there's a fire in the building and the threat is immediate. But when we find ourselves entering into this pattern over time, it can create an instability in the ways that we lead and manage. In fact, many organizations will find themselves uh, tipping back and forth between one set of challenges and the next, overreacting at times to um, circumstances external to themselves, and then needing to go the other direction to balance themselves. We sometimes find this in leadership in the Society of Jesus, as we select leaders who are good um, at envisioning and inspiring people, but may not have very good skills around management and the stewardship of resources. And then as we choose the next leader, we choose someone who's got much more of those management skills, but may not be as visionary or concerned as much about people and the pastoral kind of concerns of people. This kind of oscillation, right, which is often driven by reactivity is not necessarily the most discerning approach. Whereas when we approach challenges with a sense of purpose and vision, when we allow the water to clear and can, can have time to really sort through and diagnose what the issues are, we then engage the values and the passions we have to contribute and we take action. This creates a sort of virtuous cycle, a generative loop in our leadership. And it, it demonstrates that our discernment is coming from a place of consolation, from a sense of abundance, from a sense of grace, less from fear, less from a sense of reactivity or panic, less from a sense of just lurching from one crisis to the next, as firefighters sometimes do. This over time creates a healthier pattern, one where an institution or a community is able to chart a path and co-create the future that it desires for itself, rather than simply reacting to external circumstances. One is about containing anxiety, another is about unleashing potential. One is about maintaining identity at all costs, and the other is about dynamically evolving over time. As Father Francis said, 
you know, we have to have the ability to be all things to all people and at the same time be very rooted in a sense of who we are. This requires a tremendous sense of flexibility while at the same time having a clear sense of rootedness. Ignatian discernment, as we said, is beyond good judgment, beyond timely action alone, but it is to ask as an educational community, as an organization, what is God's desire for us? What is God's desire for us to contribute to the greater good? We referred to this passage from Paul and we understand um, as Jesuits, but also those who are called to be partners within an Ignatian and Jesuit context, that we have received a very special gift from the divine, a higher purpose. And it's that higher purpose that animates us and inspires us to lead even in difficult circumstances. As we approach um, and enter into this Ignatian year, we're asked to consider how to see thing, all things new in Christ, how to uh, see our circumstances in the spirit as discerning leaders of consolation and to find the grace and the gifts, the possibilities. We recall this passage from the Gospels that the eye is the lamp of the body. And when the eye is filled with light, so is the whole body. When we see and operate from a place of consolation, from a place of trust, from a place of purpose and passion, we know that we animate others to do the same and that sense of consolation is magnified. This is so different from leaders who operate from a place of fear, who then use fear as a way of manipulating others. And, and it's unfortunate, but we see examples of the second kind of, of leadership all over in the news, um, not just in India, but around the world today. Places where fear is actually used as leverage to create dominance over people and to uh, to use a sort of authoritarian power instead of liberating people and creating atmospheres and cultures where people can be all at their best, doing their best work. So by contrast, an Ignatian response to VUCA is to ask the question, where is grace at work? And what can we affirm and appreciate? I am sure that over the past year and a half, Loyola Chennai has done so much to respond to the pandemic in a discerning way, and that there's so much to affirm and appreciate about the adaptations and the creativity and the generosity that have been exercised in response to what's happened. It's to ask the question, who are we called to be? Rather than reacting out of fear and trying to simply maintain my existing identity, it's to ask the question that the future presents to us. Who am I being called to be? How are we as an institution being called to be more in the spirit of the Majus into the future? It's to, it's to actually root ourselves in what we value and desire most. It's to, to follow Ignatius's uh, encouragement that when we can name our deepest, most cherished desires, when we can acknowledge our values and, and celebrate them with one another, we're unleashing a, a sort of energy to do good in the world and to inspire one another. This is what creates that positive vision for the future. Rather than co-creating a future that we all fear, we we create a future that we long to, to build with one another. How do we care for people and for the mission together? These are essential questions of Ignatian leaders. What do we have to contribute? How do we partner with others in service for the greater good? And along the way, as Pope Francis often confronts us, as he calls us forth into a more synodal church, a more collaborative participatory church, what must we surrender in order to, to move forward together? Sometimes we as Jesuits have to take stock of our own hold on authority or positions of control um, and, and learn to let go in order to create spaces for more collaboration, for people to take up their roles of authority and to exercise their gifts. 
This involves a certain amount of surrender for us as Jesuits in trust and in confidence in our colleagues. When we consider the apostolic preferences that have been articulated by the Society of Jesus, this is a vivid example of the way that discerning leadership has been exercised in the universal Society of Jesus, and now as they influence all of our apostolic works. The, the variety of ways in which the world is suffering, in the ways in which the world presents needs, um, in particular contexts, we could have gone in so many different directions. And yet by pausing to be reflective together, these were the four priorities, the four, the four preferences that emerged for us with great clarity. It took a lot of listening in order to make this happen. In fact, Jesuits were enlisted around the world, along with colleagues, to, to, to listen deeply to themselves and to their colleagues and community members, to convey this at various levels um, in terms of this process of decision making so that the general council of the Society of Jesus and Father General could listen and hear these desires, these, these, these uh, interests and con contribution, and then to begin to distill them. This process took time and discernment takes time. It's not something that can be done very quickly. Um, at the same time, when communities have deep trust and confidence with one another, discernment can be accelerated. And out of that process emerged these four very strong and, um, and dynamic preferences that should be animating all of our works. There are other examples from higher education uh, of challenges that we have to, to balance. And I'm going to stop um, after this slide to begin our conversation with, with one another. Um, as we know, discernment often is not between a good thing and a bad thing. For conscientious good people, we have to make hard choices between one good and another. And sometimes, um, as uh, Father Francis reminded us, we can't chase two rabbits at once. But at others, we have to balance polarities. We cannot solve them or, or resolve them. We have to, in a sense, pay attention to both. So these polarities I'm about to share with you are, in fact, examples of ones that we have to hold in tension with one another, not solve one way or the other. Within Jesuit education, for instance, how do we pursue excellence in terms of in institutional ranking? while at the same time ensuring access and service to the poor. This is a, a, a dilemma for those who think it has to be one or the other. But for those of us who are discerning leaders, we realize that excellence has to include both, the way in which the world understands excellence as well as the way we define it in a mission-oriented way. How, for instance, do we provide means of social mobility for our graduates? and at the same time encourage them not only to pursue worldly success, but meaningful success, giving back to society, laboring for justice. This is often a balancing act within our institutions. We know when we're doing it well, and we know when we're doing it poorly. Discerning leaders require the ability to, to keep both of these polarities in view and to pay attention as we use that that um, that metaphor of Prince Tai earlier on to both. How do we enhance the Jesuit Catholic heritage and mission and also at the same time create atmospheres of openness and embrace of diversity? How do we pursue excellence in research and in teaching and the formation of our students? Not always an easy balance to maintain. How do we promote shared governance and decision making and at the same time how as institutions do we cultivate a kind of agility and responsiveness in our decision making? So I, I think I'm about at my time limit and I'm gonna pause here and just open the space for questions. I know Father Raja and others are cultivating uh, some sense of the questions that have come up in the chat and um, I'll just uh, turn off the slides now so that we can go back to uh, our gallery view. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Now I would like to call upon our man of articulation and expression, Reverend Father Maria Arundraja, 
the director of IDCR, the Institute of Dialogue with Cultures and Religions, to moderate the session on queries and qualifications. Over to you, Father. Okay, thank you. Professor Anton Pushparaja has come out with this brilliant question. Uh, how does Indonesian discernment affect and impact our intentionality and increasingly help in evolving personally, spiritually, and socially? How Indonesian discernment is affecting and impacting our intentionality, the motivating force, the core of our energies. This is one question. Another question is, how could we have a discernment and dialogue with those who do not share with our values? Is there a possibility of dialoguing and discerning with fundamentalists or those who are opaque minded, those who don't share with our values? These are two questions for the time being. Okay. Thank you, Father Raja. You know, Ignatian discernment does have, I think, a very formative impact on what intentions we bring to our, to our, our actions. So Ignatius would invite us to be mindful, for instance, of always aligning ourselves, our intentions, our actions, and our operations with what God is calling forth. And traditionally in the spiritual exercises, that's articulated as the praise, reverence, and serve of, service of God. In our actual lives, we know that we bring praise and reverence to service of God by being fully alive, by realizing our gifts and helping others to do the same, and by serving a good greater than ourselves, the, 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 the social good, the common good of those around us. Um, as a result, there is a fundamental orientation in Ignatian discernment to bring an intention of service, of um, an outward mission focus, rather than one that's fearfully based on our service of ourselves. Um, I think uh, as well, Ignatian discernment shapes our intention um, to not only be mission oriented in the service of others and to be expressive of gratitude um, uh, of God, but it's to translate that sense of consolation into action that um, that builds up the world around us. Um, that is a contributory mindset rather than one that it's about getting for ourselves. And we know, you know, in the higher education context, there can be a great deal of competition. There can be a great deal of concern about um, status. There can be a great deal of concern around um, the prestige with which we're understood as an institution or as a faculty. Um, but in fact, the Ignatian discernment says each of these things can be traps. Um, and what we want to do is cultivate an interior freedom to see each of these things as a good thing, but they must be in service of something beyond themselves. So um, to pursue the good, but understood the good is always in reference to God who um, has created these goods for us and not to get confused between them. I hope that's helpful for this first question. For the second question, um, this question of how do we enter, engage and discern with people who do not share our values? Um, this is a universal challenge. Um, I think one of the things that Ignatius would recommend is that we pause to truly listen and understand the value of the other person. I think sometimes we, um, we have assumptions that there are differences between us, which when we in fact really get to know another person are not in fact the case. Um, so first of all, it's to, to, to test our assumptions of those differences, to listen and to get to know the other person, especially those who we might um, immediately recognize as other than us by virtue of um, status or religious perspective or ideology. Many times, in fact, um, we value many of the same things. So that would be one dimension of the answer. Another is um, when we enter into dialogue with those who are deeply different from us, sometimes uh, we have to go on a journey together to discover what is common amongst us. And, um, and that takes time and relationship building. Um, so in addition to listening to building relationship, 
Um, it's the willingness to, to accompany people over time and to, um, to discover together what kind of shared future we want to create together, harmonizing our interests. Um, so those would be a couple of things just off the top of my head. Our uh, next one is, so uh, what are the ways and means of identifying the grace from within and outside for healing the broken world? We say grace is given already. We are embedded with grace inside and outside. In the mission of healing the broken world through our education and research, what are the ways and means and the, how to understand grace? How to identify grace? How to make the potentials activated if at all they are available? Wow, that is um, that is a really powerful question. You know, um, I work with um, with indigenous people in the United States, and um, there's a lot of brokenness um, in our experience uh, as we listen as people in the church to their experience uh, of the missionary impact in their lives. And um, it's very difficult at times when focused on the brokenness to um, to spot the grace. It it lies in potential. It's waiting to be discovered, um, and some of it is anticipatory. It's the longing we have for wholeness, for reconciliation, for a sense of um, uh, of healing and. Um, and a sense that we're not any longer burdened by trauma. Um, so I think when we are confronting brokenness uh, of so many sorts in our world, uh, the brokenness of poverty, the brokenness of social discord, um, there is this sense that the grace is, um, is in store for us. It is something that we place our faith and hope in um, and we, we actually fertilize with our love, with loving action, with patience, with the willingness to enter patiently in and with empathy into the suffering of others. Um, and so by bringing love into situations where the grace is not yet felt, um, the grace is gradually discovered. It's gradually watered by our compassion, um, by the presence of God, which we carry in our hearts. Um, I hope that that makes some sense. Yeah. Mm. And the, uh, before we proceed further, this is the last question for this particular segment. And you know, in the course of our teaching profession, the course of our research, at times they get bogged down with the element of routinization, stagnancy, certain fatigue, and is there a possibility of pursuing the value of becoming man for others, woman for others, perennially without any stoppage or routinization, stagnancy? How to wriggle out of this stagnancy and getting bogged down? Sometimes there is a tendency of my voluntarily asking for retirement from this, though we might be routinely doing the work. But how to fight against this particular question of getting fatigued, mm. getting stagnated? How you know, there's so many reasons for the experience of um, fatigue and stagnancy. Some is that we're working very hard. Um, and uh, so we become tired, obviously, uh, from working hard. But we know that when we're doing things that are rooted in our passion and sense of purpose, even if they're hard and even if they require a great deal of effort, they nonetheless sustain us and we experience a lightness, a sense of flow in them. There's a great deal of research about um, creativity and flow, and uh, it indicates that when we're rooted in things that give us joy and purpose, um, no matter how hard they are, we, we continue to feel our energy maintained. It's when we're doing things that are purposeless, that are not connected to our values, um, that are not um, uh, feeling relevant, um, that we can feel uh, sometimes the routine takes over and, and a sense of tiredness um, uh, intrudes on us. So this is an opportunity to stop and to think to ourselves, well, how is this connected to my sense of calling? Um, 
where is my sense of purpose being served right now? Mm -hmm. And and is there some way in which I might align with my values and purposes in a deeper way, in a way that actually might pull me from my comfort zone right now? That might be risky, but might actually also energize me. One thing that I find um, very helpful to uh, to bring us back to a sense of um, energy uh, and aliveness is when we're open to feedback from others and um, no longer operating kind of in our own bubbles, but on the basis of that feedback, responding and adapting. When I was uh, when I was teaching undergraduates uh, and I would find myself in a rut, I would ask for my students to give me evaluation and really pay attention to what they were asking for, where they were feeling the need for a different focus or a way of engaging them or ap applying the theories that were being learned. And when I was responsive to that feedback, it actually energized me, even though it was hard to, to, to change my routine. And in fact, um, I'd say that openness to feedback can be so, so powerful. Um, and something that we, we sometimes can shy away from because we're afraid of criticism, but it can actually call forth creativity. Yes, uh, Jacob, could you come out with uh, the questions that you came across in the chat box? Yes, Jacob. Jacob. Uh, yeah. There is a question from Dr. Melvin Dikuna. Lead SCP is for service, but today's heterogeneous environment Leadership is devoid of values or ethical principles. Any hope for better future with the discerning leadership? That is one question. Then another one from Mr. Stanislas. While discernment is a continuous process, moving towards the higher purpose, I would like to know when does the process of discernment come to temporary end and to move towards to a temporary open decision? Okay. Um, so the, again, I'm going to go back to that first question. So in a, in a time when ethics and values seem to be, um, really left aside from the leadership conversation, I think what we're saying in Jesuit higher education is leadership is not value free. It is filled with values. When we go back to this story of Prince Tai, we realize values and culture and shared purpose are the animating forces of what we do in Jesuit higher education. And without them, um, we fall flat. We become like any other institution, pursuing worldly, I think, um, values and standards alone. So uh, Jesuit institutions today provide very special environments for the cultivation, I think, of a value-rich way of approaching leadership that many in our society are longing for, and I know that many young people expect of leaders. Um, people in authority positions are all on call right now because young people are watching and they want to see integrity between what we say and what we do. When they experience hypocrisy of religious leaders, of political leaders, this undermines our confidence in authority and it really undermines our willingness to put ourselves into some collaborative relationship with institutions. Um, so I think at this particular juncture in history, Jesuit education has something very, very precious to offer to the world and, and has a very important role to play in our societies, whether we're Catholic or Jesuit or not. We're part of an institution which says values and meaning and purpose and the common good are essential and non-negotiable. And that we as institutions and as communities will stand for something, even if it means sacrifice, because those values are important to us. Um, so it has a way, I think, of energizing people and restoring some sense that leadership is not just about the management of things. Um, it is also about the engagement of the unseen and all of these powerful, powerful resources that uh, that the spirit has to give to us in that territory of the unseen. With regard to decision making, you know, at some point, um, the discussion, the conversation has to come to an end and a decision has to be taken. Um, in a communal discernment process, which is a whole conversation in itself, 
the the uh, the importance is to coming to a moral consensus so that every person who has been part of the conversation and who feels like the decision will have some impact on them knows that they've been heard knows that their input has been understood and 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 uh, factored in and yet at the same time whatever the decision um that is taken um, may move in a different direction, that there can be consensus that that, that direction is going to factor in the good of the whole. Um, when that moral consensus is achieved, um, it doesn't mean that you have a majority rule. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, everybody will be completely 100% uh, satisfied that their um, agenda has been uh, achieved, but it does mean that everybody has been heard and listened to in a very respectful uh, and deep way, then the moment a decision can be taken. A at that point, once the decision has been taken, it's important that the, the community, part of that process, get behind the decision and all make it work together. Um, if there continues to be a, a sense of division, uh, this undermines uh, the good of the whole. So communal discernment is an important process um, but at some point, the dialogue has to be finished and the decision has to be taken and there's a, 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 the need to, uh, to move forward with collective action. Yes, there is one interesting question from Dr. Xavier. What's the guarantee that I have heard the unheard and seen the unseen? Perhaps, assume myself to be a leader, a powerful leader, I can impose my own views, my subjective views, pretending to be leading others. Mm. What's the guarantee that I have got the darshan of truth? That I got yeah, at least some glimpses of truth. What's wow. the guarantee? That that is really a powerful and I'd say self-aware question, right? To acknowledge the the power of biases that each of us have. Um, you know, each of us on this call is a gifted, well-educated person with a great deal of interest in, contr in contribution. Each of us has our own partial view. And um, no matter how magnificent, how well-researched, how well-formed, our perspectives are still nonetheless partial. So when we um, are endeavoring to leave other, lead others, we have to have the humility of testing our partial perspectives, our beautiful plans by getting feedback and counsel from others. Um, Father General of the Society of Jesus does not act unilaterally. He has a whole community of counselors who are there to test his assumptions and to try to improve his thinking and to offer um, uh, their input to, to actually enhance the final decision that he takes. No leader, no matter how well prepared, is able to manage the VUCA conditions that we described earlier in the call by themselves. That's why across the world, we see this movement toward teams and toward the, the development of leadership communities, people working actively to collaborate together. So um, coming back to the question, I would say, if we are convinced of the goodness of our intentions and the, um, the thoughtfulness and the kind of excellence of our plans and ideas, we should also have the confidence and humility to have them tested out by others and to, um, to actually be willing to take critical feedback. I think this is, this is a good sign for a leader. I, and I wonder if you all have the same uh, feeling. For another couple of uh, minutes uh, or another five, ten minutes, uh, you can share, uh, Devi, before we wind up the uh, remaining slides and so on, you can proceed with. Okay, sure. I'm going to share with you um, some of Father General's insights about Jesuit higher education. And I think that they're very important for us today. Um, let me go back to find that particular set of slides, which I closed down a few moments ago. Let's see if I can get them back. Uh, I'm going to have to do something with my screen here. To There we go. Hopefully that'll help find them back again. 
Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. So I will share my slides again. Hope you'll be patient with me just for a moment as we bring these up and over and down. Okay. And share slides. Okay. Sorry that took so long. So, whipping through these. Hopefully this isn't making your, your tummy sick by seeing all these things so fast. Here we are. So uh, as many of you know, Father General just authored a book on the way with Ignatius in celebration of the Ignatian year. And there are several things that he shares in the book, which are um, his reflections on the role of Jesuit higher education today. And so I think they may be helpful for us as we bring our call to a close and, um, and consider how we wanna take this forward. For one thing, Father General speaks on this question of faith and reason. And he, he acknowledges that even um, today in a world which is so obsessed with the quantitative and the, um, the empirical, that nonetheless, Jesuit education has a very particular role to play in holding together the complementarity, not the contradiction, but the complementarity of faith and reason. And that as the discussion uh, unfolded and we had the question around values and ethics today, it's that Jesuit education take a stand that academic formation of our students today must be accompanied by attention to their spiritual growth. Now, that means, for instance, that for a good Hindu, that a good Hindu is, is the best Hindu they can be. For a Catholic, that the Catholic is the best Catholic they can be. Um, for someone who's not religious, that their spiritual growth is cultivated in a way that is humanistic and ethical and values oriented. This, um, this combination of the intellectual and affective formation and the concern for the social good, uh, Father General says, is essential. And without it, we're not doing Jesuit higher education. Another um, uh, point he, he raises is, you know, we live in times when the orientation toward individualism is so powerful. And whether we come from a collectivist society or an individualist society by cultural background, nonetheless, a lot of the globalization of values these days is pushing people in the direction of an individualism, which is somewhat selfish and can be disconnected with the wider social good. So here again, Father General um, puts together the essential connection between the good of the individual and the good of the whole. Um, the support of a, a developing global citizenship that all of our graduates um, are intended to, to embody as they head into the working world, as they head into responsible civic and public life. Um, so this creative tension of individual and collective pursuit of happiness, uh, I thought was very important. Um, related to that is this question of how we are inviting our students to mature. And um, the idea that our concern for the common good is not limited to the social good alone, but as the fourth apostolic preference makes clear, it is vitally connected to our common home, to the earth itself. Um, you and I know that climate projections for the impact of the warming of the planet for India are quite severe. The concern, right, is one that we today must act upon 
um, so as not to inflict devastating uninhabitable climate conditions upon uh, your children, your children's children. So this concern for a sense of the social good expanded to include the good of the earth is, is an essential one from a Jesuit uh, educational point of view. Um, you know, we live in times where pluralism in society is a great asset. And yet, for those who are afraid of difference and diversity, it also is a source of polarization and conflict. We know that this is uh, the case in so many of our societies around the world, um, including in India. And yet the university is intended to be a space where this diversity is, is celebrated and embraced from a place not of fear, but of appreciation for the richness of the way in which God's creation is manifest in each of our cultures. Um, it is not to be afraid of this difference, but actually to explore um, the, uh, the, the beautiful relatedness that we all share and uh, to create educational access, which is universal. Not only obviously for Catholics or believers, um, uh, people of faith, but for all people, who are interested in willing and having the kind of education that we, we cherish, that we honor, that we cultivate, that we want to sustain and enhance, and who want to take those values out into the world uh, beyond the, the university context. Um, finally, this question of vocation, which uh, Father General um, has, uh, has really highlighted. You know, the mission, uh, as he says, is not taught, but it's it's received. It's something that's caught in the atmosphere of Jesuit higher education. Those of us who have been inspired to a religious vocation know that it was because we were inspired by people who embodied the spirit and did it in a joyful, dynamic, creative, and intellectually engaging way. The same is the case for, for us and for our students as we look at the context of our universities as as, in a sense, seedbeds, as seminaries, not of priests and nuns alone, but as places where people will find a sense of their calling and purpose and then have that calling and purpose named and reflected back to them by faculty and formators um, who will come to life uh, with confidence and uh, with um, a lot of uh, commitment to, uh, to living that calling in a very vivid way and stepping into the world not with a sense of simply pursuing worldly success alone, but having a purpose to serve, having a role, a, a meaningful contribution to make. So with that, um, I want to conclude my comments and just thank you for uh, this time that you've provided me to, to share my thoughts, uh, partial as they are, unformed and sometimes spontaneous as they are. Um, it has been truly uh, an honor to be with you, and um, I, uh, I look forward to visiting you at some point in the future. Thank you, David. There are two more questions which we are not going to address right now. The time is up, more or less. And uh, the question uh, from Stani is, discernment is an ongoing process. Is it on a temporary basis or on a permanent basis? It's as a pedagogy, as an ongoing process. How do you understand the very process of, uh, 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 of we zero down to only temporary uh, findings? No, what is the nature of a discernment? There is one one question from Stani and mm. Jansi. Jansi is uh, raising another question with regard to, okay, seeing everything new, everything new in our pluralistic context in India, is there a guarantee again? Can all of us can see the newness everywhere from every quarter, but we need to probe further. Well, dear friends, it's time for to wind up. So, uh, thank you, uh, David. You know, in the mission of healing the broken world, uh, in the mission of healing the broken world, also human family and the cosmic family. We these are the takeaways. You know that we have after listening to you. Integrity is our heartbeat. Self-critic is our birthright. And this is how we can uh, tackle the partial and provisional understanding of the own perception. Resilience in getting awakened to the graces within and also certain steadiness in identifying the divine in others. 
and there should be a passion for approaching a, 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 having the access of points of convergence in every dialogue in every collaboration points of convergence and classroom is the site of salvation for us it's a field work site of field work is the holy land for us laboratory is the sacred spot for us and the library is the burning bush for us and the contemplation is a birthright to promote their dignity democracy and dignity thanks a lot you know our salvation is a community salvation and a cosmic salvation and we like to go ahead as educators working with students as co-creators with god and co-born with mother nature and co-worker with all humans thank you so much for triggering such things over to esther and the colonizers thank you father thank you father for god promoting a god provoking session now lord teach us to be generous i would like to call upon our ever smiling professor kulandai terasal the the principal of loyola college of education to deliver the vote of thanks over to you ma'am thank you ma'am gratitude is not only the greatest of all virtues but the parent of all other i deem it an honor and privilege to deliver the vote of thanks on this beautiful day let me start by giving glory to the almighty god for making today's occasion on commemorating the 500th year of ignatian enlightenment a grand success leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that sure that impacts last in your absence first and foremost i would like to thank reverend dr david mckellum sj executive director jesuit headquarters rome who despite his busy schedule has found time to share his wisdom with us on this great occasion i thank father for his inspiring words of great wisdom on developing the attitudes skill and knowledge on becoming a discerning leader in an ignatian context i am grateful to the jesuit management and reverend dr francis p xavier sj the rector and the vice president of the campus for his warm welcome and for giving an amazing opening for this day's session on discerning leadership thank you father i express my heartfelt thanks to reverend dr jo prun sj director of liba for inviting and splendidly introducing reverend dr david mckellum sj the chief guest thank you father i also thank reverend dr maria arul raja sj for brilliantly moderating the question and answer session and also to reverend dr justin prabhu and reverend dr irday raj for their immense help in the question and answer session thank you fathers i also thank reverend dr justin prabhu and professor samson for the technical assistance on conducting today's program in webex platform i express my immense thanks to reverend dr jacob sj director loyola campus ministry for coordinating and organizing this excellent webinar which is a great benefit for all i thank the directors principals and secretaries of loyola college of arts and science loyola institute of business administration loyola college of education loyola ecam college of engineering and technology institute of dialogues with cultures and religion loyola college metella and loyola college vetavalam for motivating and allowing your staff to take part in this webinar i owe a special thanks to professor suman and the lizard coif for his invocation and professor esther masila for a splendid master of ceremony i especially thank all the faculty of various institutions 
and everyone who have actively participated in this session and made this a resounding success. Thank you all once again. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. As we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. Ite inflamate ominia. Go forth and set the world on fire. With the spirit of Majis, we are deeply loved, greatly blessed, highly favored in Christ. Thank you, everyone. Omnipus Kratya Stibi. Have a reflective evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank all you. The best. Thank you so much. All the best. Have a good day. Good evening. I'm very good.